Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the final teaching session of the uh, sketching school. I'm Kristen Kornienko. I'm a, a faculty member at the RAA, RAIC Center for Architecture at Athabasca University. And I'm the coordinator of the collaboration that is the Global Studio. Um, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement and then we'll go ahead and do the introduction and, and, um, and then Chibuzo will begin with his presentation. I'm privileged to look out at a beautiful lake on the lands formerly known as the Salish region of Turtle Island, today known as interior British Columbia within the political boundaries of Canada. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm a fifth generation white settler now living and working as an uninvited guest on the lands of the Sequetmec Nation and that, benefit, and that I benefit from the intergenerational wealth of land ownership. I'm a squatter on these lands. The region was not negotiated by treaty and remains to this day unceded. Immediately around where I stay, this includes the people of the Splatchine, Nisconlith, and Squilax bands. Hooksjam, or thank you. A, a Splatchine band council member described the Sequetmec traditional lands to me as roughly defined by the Shushwap Lake watershed and occupied since time immemorial by the nation's diverse cultures. This is archeological, there's archeological evidence of their presence dating back over 15,000 years. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the ancestors and people of these bands for their ongoing inclusive activities towards healing, conciliation, and in defense of the land, water, and creatures of this region. And I commit to contribute to this in my role as a designer, educator, and activist. I'd also like to acknowledge that within these traditional lands is the Tecamloops and the site of the Kamloops res Residential School, where the first of the unmarked mass graves was found on residential school sites across Canada. I also live and work in Egoli or Johannesburg, South Africa, on veld that is the traditional lands of the people of the Soto Twana. I learned in the course of my research that significant gold deposits were discovered in both these locations within four years of each other in the mid 1850s, triggering colonial mechanisms of land appropriation, displacement of communities thousands of years old, cultural assimilation and imperial resource extraction. I'd like to hold a space for just a moment to think about and honor the reality of this land acknowledgement and what it means and challenges us to act on. The last four weeks have been the first steps towards reimagining the sketching school that McGill University has held since 1921. It's been a privilege to collaborate and work through what language, uh, what language such as reimagining, decolonizing, indigenous, cross-cultural mean, and grappling with how this relates to arch architectural representation and the practice of design. For myself, I can say that it has been, it has really embodied the, the reality that to practice cross-culturally does not mean cultural voyeurism or cultural appropriation or the mastering of other cultures. It's the humility to acknowledge and decenter the white social construct as the norm from which to look at other cultures. Instead, understanding that what we call other cultures are in reality the personal and collective experiences, built environments and histories in people's everyday lives. And when we gather, it's what we all bring to the table. Which turns us to the quote I began with four weeks ago, but for myself has much deeper resonance. From the Anishinaabe elder, Fred Kelly, 
He says, ours is the gift and the struggle of standing side by side, different and together. The metaphor of coming to the table as a place of gathering, interaction, and sharing, whether food or knowledge, is a common one. But those classroom or community or professional tables are not always places of collaboration. Growing up, I ate meals at a family table where my father sat at the head. He was very generous providing food and sharing his knowledge. We had rich conversations that were in turn interesting, heated, fun, and tearful but I was not allowed to get up from that table without asking permission. That dynamic of hierarchical power and control became my norm. The frightening thing about norms is that they seep into our subconscious until they just become how we walk through the world. Particularly as a young woman, I now recognize that that norm I grew up with was a violence. It ingrained a patriarchy that I still struggle with today. For many white people, using the language of white supremacy makes them uncomfortable and defensive. Despite the overwhelming evidence of its reality and consequence in our post-colonial world, our white social construct remains all too often the norm from which we teach, learn, design, walk through the world. Speaking to the need to decenter whiteness and the Western canons of knowledge, Shundana Yousaf, in her work around architectural education, points out that nationalist histories and spurious philosophies of the genius of special articulated as Western white people remains at the heart of many of our teaching and its materials. Here in Canada, between 2007 and 2015, we had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission a practice modeled after South Africa's apartheid Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Here it addressed the legacy and contemporary of colonialism and the Indian residential schools, the last of which closed in 1996. The TRC found the government of Canada and its colonial actions and policies guilty of cultural genocide against the diverse peoples of the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities across Turtle Island, the place we now call Canada. Canada's final TRC report calls for governments, educational institutions, civil society groups, and all Canadians to act on its four, 94 calls to action. I'd like to point to 63.3 which states building student capacity for intercultural understanding, empathy, and mutual respect. The residential schools were the colonial mechanisms of assimilation into white Western social construct. Today, we continually, today I continually challenge my own work, recognizing the need for learning and unlearning to decolonize my mind. Asking if there is critical decolonizing value in the work, or is it simply a more palatable reframing of assimilation? Our intent with this sketching school is curriculum, uh, is curriculum change. It is the first steps toward decentering our Western white educational practices and materials. The quote I used from above from Elder Fred Kelly is from the work of Aaron Mills. He brings his self-identified Anishinaabe lineage into his argument for legal pluralism in right relation here in Canada with Crown and Indigenous law. I was exposed to his work at a symposium on federalism, identity, and public policy in our changing times, which I attended at McGill Law School. It reminds us of the need to do the same in architecture to not allow ourselves to fall into the deeply problematic trap of indigenous, non-indigenous binary thinking. Last week, I read to you from the work of Canadian author Essie Edugian, who self-identifies as a member of the African diaspora, her parents having chosen to leave Ghana. And Joanna, who was our collaborator last week, in her bio shared in our collaboration with the sketching school that she self-identifies as a member of the Jewish diaspora, her parents 
World War II refugees from Slovakia. Sechaba shared planned drawings of a slave ship and their haunting resemblance to the planned drawings of housing layouts for Soweto as it became home to Black Africans forcibly re relocated within their own ancestral lands. Every day I drive across and hear the train on the train on Canada's National Rail Line. Beginning in 1880, Canada's colonial government commissioned 4,600 kilometers of rail line to be built across Canada, which brought European settlers to and extracted resources from across the continent. That rail line was built predominantly by 12,000 Chinese workers, almost 10% of whom died. Today, higher numbers of people are refugees or are moving from their home regions because of conflict, economics, and climate change than ever before. Last week, Henry shared how, as an immigrant himself, he grapples with a sense of identity and belonging in Canada and in the country he left. These examples of human experience barely touch the surface of the complexity of colonialism in today's societies. How do we respond as human beings and as designers? Why does it matter to our study and practice of architecture? In his book, Designs for, Plur for a Pluriverse, Radical Interdependence, Autonomy, and the Making of Worlds. Colombian development critic and theorist Arturo Escobar contextualizes pluralism within architecture by arguing that design by virtue of its materiality hardwires particular kinds of politics into bodies, spaces, and objects. In this series of workshops and feedback sessions over the past four weeks, sketching has been presented as a process that frames how we document and the, document knowledge and understand the world around us and how this informs architectural design. I hope we all now recognize more deeply the urgency of asking the critical question, whose frame are we using? How do we continue to learn and unlearn and find humility as we increasingly work across di diverse human everyday lived experiences and histories? As we said at the start, these workshops remain a work in progress. We continue to grapple over these types of questions as we work to bring real change to curriculum and truth to historical and national narratives. So as to value racial and gender identities, cultures and worldviews, and to shift paternalism and privilege. In this process, we will continue to have moments of dis disconnect and discomfort. None of us can, get, can always get things right, but we can always op be open and willing to step towards other perspectives and ideas. I can only speak for myself when I say how much I've learned and enjoyed the drawing I've done in the last few weeks exploring the techniques that have been shared with us over and and it has given me a, a new sense of grounding in the landscapes structures and figures i've drawn and in myself as well it's renewing my mental landscape and living and giving me a hope for a more just way forward in this final session of the sketching school will be will have the perspectives from chibuzo and david Henry sends his regrets at having to step out of the remainder of the sketching school, but he has had a family emergency. And I know that all of our positive prayers and thoughts are with them. Each of our collaborators have brought different approaches and life experiences to drawing and how drawing informs architecture. I'd like to remind everyone that for some, this is deeply rooted in their own personal painful histories, as well as our collective histories of cultural genocide, slavery, and the social constructs of white supremacy. As teachers, we speak of providing safe spaces for these conversations. But the recent work of Sykes and Gachago on safe learning spaces reminds us that caring is a fundamentally relational activity that happens in a web of reciprocal relationships. In other words, we need a solidarity amongst all of us that supports participants' openness and courage. 
conversations around decolonization can be triggering. I've put a contact for our student mental health team on the Sketching School Miro board. Please reach out if you feel you need to. And finally, I'd like to say wait and sabonani or hello to the youth of the Splatchin Chamaltzin Society, a teaching center here on the traditional lands of the Splatchin people in the Sequepec Nation, and the youth of Cliptown Soweto, South Africa, who have joined us for the sketching school. It's our hope that we've shared our passion for architecture and some drawing skills, and that this will ignite some dreams of becoming architects. Hooks jam to Aaron in Splachin and Ngiabonga Gakulu to Tabang and Bafana in Cliptown for helping us to make this happen. And again, thank you, Douglas and the Opus Art Store in Kelowna for supplying all the youth with art supplies. We will be we will continue to post their drawings on the mural board. Sechaba, Joanna, and Henry have all offered to do youth sessions. So we will be keeping that part of the sketching school going. If any of you would like to join us to participate, please feel free to email me. Just a reminder that the sessions have been recorded and all of them are available on the Global Studio website. Additionally, I continue to update the mural board with our drawings and additional resources. Our final feedback sessions will be this Friday, and I really hope and encourage uh, many of you to join us. Again, thank you to everyone uh, for the work that's gone into this sketching school and to all of you for participating. Enjoy the drawing and I hope you feel the power of its healing. I'd also just like to remind you that we have the final exhibit of drawings and discussion of the course on March 14th. We'd really appreciate your feedback, both on the content of the course and on how you think it worked or didn't work as on, in its online sketching, uh, online format, as this is the first time we've done the sketching school this way. That exhibit will be part of a mini festival on the future of architecture and architectural education that the Global Studios is, is hosting, which is running from March 9th to the 23rd. Please have a look at the Global Studio website for details. And I'd like to highlight that we will be kicking off the Global Studio Mentoring Network uh, with a mixer during that festival. Today, we're really excited to collaborate with Chibuzo Ohaneje. His love of both art and architecture manifested from his earliest days as a young scholar, earning him winning positions in, art, in the arts, graphics, and design competitions but he says it was his excellence in mathematics and physics that served as a catalyst for his interest in architecture. He is now a Nigerian licensed architect with a penchant for Afrocentrism rooted in African belief systems. Despite attending universities in Nigeria, his training was an all Western pedagogy. He then connected the dots backwards to his cultural roots in 2020 during a fully immersive internship with the Community Planning and Design Initiative Africa. His exceptional performance in the cohort honed his perspectives in African-centered architecture and earned him the position of global ambassador for the organization. He later became an instructor at the CPDI Africa Global Studio for African-centered architecture. Chibuzo believes that African architecture is unique, that it is deeply rooted within the cultures and philosophies of the people, providing a true understanding of their history, belief systems, and synergy between people and nature. He lives in Uyo, Nigeria, where he offers design and consultancy services to public and private built environment organizations. So we're really excited to have him today. And with that, I will stop sharing the Miro board. I have it up just as a reminder for people to check the resources there. And I will pass this over to you, Chibuzo. Thank you, Christian. Welcome, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. 
I'm excited to be here today. And I'm going to be talking on visualizing the unintended. Like Christian said, my name is Shibuzo Ohaneja, I'm an architect. And this presentation today is brought to you in collaboration with the Global Studio of the RS University. I'm also an instructor in CPDR. Shibuzo, we've lost your audio. About... Can you hear me? Yeah, you're back on now. Okay. Sketching exercises often assist the student in the hand-eye coordination, scaling of objects, articulation of light and color, drawing style and techniques. In the African environment, the student quickly observes multiple visual layers in the as built that quickly identify as unintentional aesthetics, functional retrofitting, field material specification, noise and visual pollution, poverty and clash between urban and rural architectural languages. This workshop therefore intends to visually articulate how buildings are actually used in the communities in which they are placed, irrespective of the architect's well-meaning intentions, in order to influence design education and studio practices, encouraging more culturally sound, aesthetically pleasing, visual friendly architecture that is easy to afford and maintain. The workshop will focus on informing the sketcher to be sensitive to capturing these nuances on paper, to generate ideal case studies in bridging the gap between design philosophy taught in tertiary education and society where foreign imported design practices are creating field and dysfunctional built environments. We are going to look at six observations during the course of this presentation. And the six observations are going to also form part of the assignments at the end of the presentation. The, present, the observations we are going to look at are number one, purpose of sketching exercise, a deeper intent revealed. Number three, aesthetics, color, identity, material impact maintenance. Number five, landscape and environment. Number six, sketching and designing for location. So let's have your observation one, purpose of sketching exercise. Sketching actually copies reality. When you sit down to sketch, you're actually reproducing what you are seeing in front of you. It's a not through which a person looks at a picture and reproduces it. But it's also a not where somebody can bring an idea or a thought of a design in his head that is not existing already and put it down into a paper. In this first observation, the objective will be to see how much detail can be articulated in your sketch. So we're going to look at it in two parts. Number one, to capture details. When you sketch, the way you play with lighting, color, shadow scale, the, the darker you, you, you make your shadow, the lighter you, you make your color, proportion, and all those things, they convey meaning depending on the depth of what you are doing. The more shadow you add or the more color you add can have different meaning. If you look at, for instance, the picture on the upper right, those of the masks, you can see they are the same masks, but in three different lines. And each mask have a different visual instruction as you're looking at it. The first row is just a light sketch. The second row you see a deeper shades, and the third row is where you introduce colors. You can see that merely looking at those sketches, the way color, light, shadow are played with, it gives you a different perception. When you sketch, you also capture real life 
situations, real situations in the sense that what you are sketching in front of you might not be what was actually designed to be or intended. But in your sketching exercise, you are actually reproducing what you are seeing. You, you, you can then see the difference between what you are sketching and what was designed. In observation two, we are going to look at a deeper intent revealed. Intent versus use. We are familiar with the Sullivan axiom of form follows function. And as a matter of fact, in my years in architecture school, and most of us in Africa, we know this axiom well, where you are told that the most important thing is how you make a building function, how you arrange spaces. And your form should, 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 should arise from that of organization of spaces into functions. But the objective of this particular lesson is to show that this doesn't always apply to especially the African birth environment. Design versus use. Theoretically, whenever an architect does a design, he has, in his mind, he has solved all the issues and met all the client requirements. And he has looked at aesthetics and other variables to arrive at a building that he thinks should work the way it should work. So the way he designs it is the way in his mind he thinks it should work. But if you look at the two pictures, the one on the up, upper left and the one below, you start on the second example, that is actually a residential building that was designed to house six flats. But the landlord decided to rent most of those flats to business uh, owners, mostly places of worships. If you look at the picture very well, you are going to see that there are five churches occupying those six flats. So actually it's only one user that is using the space as it was designed. This shows that the architects and the clients and even the zoning authorities, they were not in synchronization when this was designed and after it, it was permission to be used. And this obviously gives rise to a lot of noise, air, and sound pollution. Observation three, aesthetics, color, and identity. Africa is known with its own range variety of colors. We like colors, we play a lot with colors. And that's where the, the difference is. The, the way we perceive color and the way we were taught color in school. Karen Milbourne said that in European art, color is generally understood in terms of primary colors, which we are taught in school, red, yellow, and blue. Those are the three primary colors. But however, in most African societies, their primary colors are red, white, and black. You see that that is already showing the gap between what we were taught and what is actually happening within our communities. So the objective of this particular exercise is to understand colors and lighting, the way they can be captured in your sketch. Beyond the colors. The way we use color, they, they, they convey different meanings to different people. But those meanings are not universal. Like we discovered in not everything works in one size. Field. Color is true, can add a lot of aesthetics to your sketch, to your drawing. Adding color can make it come alive. It can give it a different meaning like we saw at the beginning. But they also symbolize the identity and the uniqueness of the place you are sketching. Look, for example, the first picture on the upper um, left that is actually a building in Senegal. The way you look at the color, it seems as if there are too many colors and, and, and they, 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 they create a kind of um, confusion, but that is not the case. In this case, all those colors mean something. They are unique. They identify this place to give it that originality. Significance of color 
to defy our environment, uh, uh, beauty is in the eye of the environment. What somebody sees as a beauty that is judged by the one that is perceiving the space or that is using the space. But in Africa, certain color combinations can articulate beauty and they can make that scene you are sketching to be distinctive. And the richness in color, like in the, the picture on the lower left corner, shows you something that is peculiar to this building in South, in South Africa. Whenever you see this color, if you are somewhere that they travel, you know this especially belongs to the South African re region. Observation four, material impact maintenance. Material localized Yes, wherever we have a building that is designed, there are a lot of questions that can happen on how that building will be erected. But the materials you now use to erect that particular building will make that begin to plus zone or region has its own material that happen within that area and maybe design local materials available because using the local materials available we make that design sustainable see the other disconnect between costs a huge disconnect between those three factors quality that is inexpensive due to economic factor prevailing in the community impact the visual example are these buildings on the first picture you can see that cheap paint was used on both buildings and you can see it already looks like an ice saw but in the mind of the architect that was not what was intended but because the material that we used didn't suit the particular environment where this building is located is actually failing as if the design is a failed design the potential of low quality material is Obviously, this test for as evidence during rainy season. Yes, those materials that happen locally are already tested and proven by the climate that happened in that locality. So, using them for your particular building is actually marrying your design to that environment. So, that will make to have less maintenance and you make the building in sync with that environment. That's why we use sustainable materials those are some materials respond to climate as you can see in the second picture we see this building by the mass moko shows a mastery in use of indigenous materials those are actually clay bricks and this building has been there for long as you can see it still looks neat it still looks fine it still looks great anytime any day you come to this building it still looks fresh as compared to the two buildings that we looked in the picture above, which have materials that were used that didn't really suit the environment where they were built. This become a standard for designers to utilize materials found in the observation five, landscape and environment. What to the landscaping we can see two pictures on this slide why this slide is important is because most designers on the the environmental dynamics whatsoever design they are making is supposed to fit into an environment and that environment has its own dynamics and trees and vegetation are also part of those dynamics and deciding to ignore them is what is causing this climate change we are talking about and we are even suffering we're not talking about it. it has become a global phenomenon that is affecting all of us so the objective of this particular slide is to see that good landscaping articulate the subject of our sketching exercise landscape impact lack of landscaping robs the architectural project of the natural setting yes because we are not designing a structure to stand in the air 
whatever structure design a bit in Europe or in America or Africa is meant to be built at a particular location. So ignoring the green, the trees, the vegetation of that lo location makes that building look as if it is alien. Let me use that term, yes. Because it's supposed to blend with that environment. You're supposed to integrate those greeneries into the environment. Concrete everywhere kills the liveliness of the building. Like in the first picture, we see um, interlocking stones that they used to pave around the whole building. There is no green. Not only will it make the building to be hot, because when, when the sun hits at those interlocking stones, they, they, they generate heat and they reflect back to the building. So it, it, it is, it's a poor um, climate control for the building itself, but it is an eyesore. There's there no pleasantness into looking at this kind of scenery. Environmental impact. Like I said, the trend these days, the, the these days is to cover everywhere with everywhere to look neat in quotes. But for we tend to forget that trying to make everywhere to look neat is actually killing us because killing the environment is, is killing us. We we can we can we cannot live without the environment, we cannot live without those, those trees. So it's our duty to not only incorporate them because they give us life, but because it is also good to look at. The example shown, the, 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 the second one shows how a design was done considering a landscape, a well thought landscape. You can see trees, you can see water, you, you, you can see bare ground, and you can also see those paved areas, all in right proportional uses. Observation six, sketching and designing for location. Design should be location specific. Like I said at the beginning, we, we were taught this um, architecture that is supposed to be universal, the Western type of architecture. But the one size fit all doesn't apply successfully in the built environment. It doesn't. Because the considerations that are taken in Russia are not the same considerations that are taken here in New York, in Nigeria. They are completely different. So whatever design that is done in Russia should be done taking the consideration of that location, whatever happens there. And whatever design is done in, in Nigeria should be done taking into consideration whatever happens. In. Every region has its own property, climatic property. So, for instance, here in Africa, we design uh, uh, our problem is heat. So the design is to make sure that we repel heat as much as we can so that we can have a pleasantly cool indoor environment when the outside environment is hot. As against the cool weather in the Western world, we are, they, is, they design to retain heat. So those factors already tells you that the design in those two places should be different. It is not one size fit all. Cultural on that is not only about climate. Every region has its own way of life, its own culture. And architecture is tied to culture. You cannot remove you are designing for somebody's way of life, the way he's going to make use of, of, of that space. So the way of life is 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 enshrined into somebody's culture. So trying to do away with those cultural undertones. And also we discovered that in Africa have almost the same similar type of culture. You can see that in the way they, the way they dress, even in their traditional architecture. That is something that we should promote. Then the right materi materials. Any material, somebody say any material that is used more than 10 kilometers radius from where, any material that is sourced from more than 10 kilometers radius from where it is intended to use will not be sustainable. Why? Like I said, John has already undergone the test of the weather or the climate of that location. So it is the perfect fit for whatsoever thing you are building. Taking that material and erecting your structure makes it work in one with nature. And it will solve your problem of climate change. It will even become cheap for you to build because you don't need to go very far to go 
who can procure your materials. Whatever you need to build are uh, right there within you. So it cut, completely cut short the transportation costs. Conclusion is lesson learned, visualizing the unintended. An African focused exercise will be the process of exam examining what the architect envisaged, then just oppose it against what is manifested in the bird environment. What did the architect design? Then how are the end users using it? Those two scenarios, are they in synchronization or are they completely in conflict? One week, we have this takeaways. Africa, the purpose of sketch will reveal not just what was intended, but the African narrative, how are people using it? What, what is the story that is actually happening within that scene that you are looking at to sketch? A deeper meaning. What was intended by the designer? What were his plans? What were his goals? Then how are they using the space that the designer didn't intend? So intended and unintended uses. Point number three, aesthetics, color, identity. The beauty is in the eye of the be beholder. We saw that in Africa is not really the way it is defined in the Western setting. So there is that understanding that you must have, that whatsoever local you are standing or sitting to sketch, you should understand how the color maintenance, the benefit of using local materials. Like I said, Whatever material, like the, the first picture that is a school that is done by architect. You have to please it your design that was an integral part of this school. That the material he used are clay bricks that he can easily get from the environment within which that, that school was built. But the picture below shows um, a design that is done with a flat roof, the paints are cheap, wrong use of materials. And the vision already looks like an eyesore because there was no care taken to specify the right materials for this building. And these exposed walls are not really good in this type of environment and climate because of the heavy type of rainfall. Landscape and environment, the value of landscaping aside, like I said, the sketching and designing for location. The one size fit all, I've said it before, doesn't work. It, it is, is a failure. Every locality has its own identity. So who's, who's ever is designing or sketching or is proposing a design for a particular location should make find that location. Those are the six takeaways that we have from here comes your assignments. We talked of six observations, which be six assignments to choose from. So you're expected to choose one out of this is or if you can, you can do more, but you're expected to choose at least one from this observation. So this is the assignment on observation one. Observation you wish to highlight in your exercise in your presentation. Then observation one, if you were to sketch a building such as the one you can see on the screen on your assignment, the assignment will be to highlight observation one, purpose of sketching. This building shows, as you can see, various degrees of light, shadow, color, gradients of color, uh, different pen assignments. And those are the details you can see in this building. But in your assignment, whatsoever building you are going to choose, and you're going to include the picture also, you are going to sketch 
that building the same way as you can see this one on this page. Phasing gradients will highlight certain areas more or less. So we are going to either see more details or less details in your sketching, but your sketching should be a replicate of what you are seeing. That is for those that want to do assignment on observation one. Assignment on observation two, you also to include a photograph of your selected building. That if you were to select a building such as the one you are looking at on your screen, your assignment will be to highlight observation two, which is a deeper intent revealed. This particular building is designed to be a block of flats and it was designed based on planning and zoning uh, uh, um, reg, 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 regulations. You are supposed to find a building like this, but a building like this with the use being or uh, the use of that particular building was altered from what the original intent was. So what you're going to do in that assignment is you are going to sketch it the way it was originally intended by the designer. They are going to give an assign an assessment why you think that the use was altered by the current occupant or the owner himself. Assignment on observation three. Again, you are going to attach a picture photograph of the big building you are selecting or the scene you are selecting. Then your assignment will be to highlight observation three. That is aesthetics, color, and identity. This particular building, like I said before, is the Alliance Franco Senegalese building in Koala, Senegal. It was done by architect Patrick Juradjik. So as you can see, you can see how there's patterns of color. The background is black and white colors then the front is different colors on different posts that already gives it that identity even the, the floor itself has uh, some colorful um, um, symbols so what you're going to do in this is select select a building that has this kind of identity or a building that, is better, that doesn't have this kind of identity and suggest this kind of cultural aesthetics to it. Assignment four. That was assignment of observation four. Again, you are going to include a photograph of the selected building for your, to your presentation. And uh, what the material impact and maintenance. The building here is a student hostel. You can see that the, the, there was a there was one specification of materials and this has made this building look like a slum. They use cement and cheap paint, and this looks like an eyesore. So can you relatively sketch both what the architect designed alongside what it has become so that it will be easy for you to see that contrast? Assignment on observation five. Observation five, remember, talks about landscape and environment. Again, you are going to include a photograph of the building you are selecting to work on, on this observation five. On this observation five, you can look at this building and it's done by Dimas Moko, that is Nigeria's premier architect, Afrocentric architect and creative. The man is really a genius. You need to go to this particular building and most of the buildings scattered in Nigeria to understand how this man was able to marry architecture to the environment. Marry this building to the environment. The way he incorporates the greenery into his environment is unique. And you can see a lot of cultural elements also alongside the, the use of materials that fit that particular environment. So what you're going to do in this assignment is to find uh, a barren building that didn't consider landscaping and sketch it. And you now propose an appropriate landscaping for this, for that particular building that you are sketching. And possibly also add an edible landscaping into it. 
assignment on observation six. Again, we are going to include a picture photograph of whatever building you're letting. And your assignment is going to highlight observation six, sketching and designing for location. This particular building is uh, a palace. The city of Fumban that's located in the northeastern part of Cameroon is designed by architect. It's symbolism in it. You can see it's actually two snakes interwoven with a spider as a crown. And this is the symbol, this is the emblem of the Baboon people in Cameroon. And the architect decided to, to design this to represent that identify the people that are back. Okay, I, that, it looks like um, Chibuzo just lost his connection. Um, we, I think he was just about at the end of his uh, presentation. And just as a reminder, I will um, be posting that presentation on the Miro board. So you'll be able to go and review both um, his, his presentation and have a, a look at the at assignments that he's suggesting. Um, and now, uh, We'll give Chibuzo just another minute to see if he reconnects and um he's re he's reconnected Kristen. okay Chibuzo, do you um, want to um, we lost you there do you want to um I think yeah. I stopped I think I stopped on this assignment on observation six all right yes yes that's 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 the last assignment so Thank you for joining us to, today on our presentation. We look forward to looking at the assignments on Friday. Thank you, Chibuzo. And just a reminder, Chibuzo and I will be hosting the feedback session on um, Friday morning at 9 a.m. Mountain Time. And with that, I will pass things over to you, David. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Kristen. And Chibuzo, thank you so much. I hope to be able to join you on Friday morning. I'd love to see um, how people, how everyone responds to your, uh, your assignment. Oh, that would be I'll, great, I'll, David. Yeah, I'll do my best. Um, okay, okay. I'll, I'll share the screen now. Are you seeing a title slide? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Okay, terrific. So I hope the technology is reliable. Um, and uh, I don't think I'll need more than 25 or 30 minutes, which uh, should leave us some time to uh, talk a little bit about both presentations and any other ideas that uh, have come up. Um, I, I wasn't sure what to, um, what to talk about today. Um, given the uh, unexpected twists and turns, this amazing exercise that Douglas and Henry and Kristen have put together um, has turned out. Um, but I thought that today might be a good time to return to a few ideas about basic drawing, uh, starting with uh, what, what I'm going to refer to as the versatility and power of the simple line, you know, whether it was made with a pencil or a pen. Um, whether it's made with a brush, uh, whether it's made with a stick in the, in the sand. Um, so the, I want to talk about the power of the line and I hope that, uh, and, and a few other ideas, which I hope will be useful for those of you interested in taking up Chibuzo's challenge to explore some of the uh, lessons in his, uh, in his six, in his taxonomy of six 
uh, kinds of observation. The title of my presentation, of course, comes from Paul Clay, uh, to whom I've referred before, who famously once referred to drawing uh, as an active line on a walk, moving freely without goal. Uh, so uh, to, date, to this day, uh, uh, architects and teachers and artists uh, often refer, often paraphrase what Clay actually wrote. Um, as uh, taking a line for a walk, which is, uh, which is the, what I've used for my title today. Um, the drawing on the left of your screen is a drawing that we looked at a few weeks ago. And I talked about uh, how the lines that pick up the window pattern and the floor levels on that round tower, which is in the center of uh, Bucharest. Um, I talked about how those lines that pick up the windows and the floor levels almost disappear uh, on the side of the tower facing the light, in this case, the afternoon sun. Uh, I hadn't even noticed that I'd, I'd made the drawing that way, but one of my colleagues at the uh, Yonminko University of Architecture and Urbanism, which was just two blocks away, three blocks away from this building, uh, made the observation. And what she saw uh, was, that, was that I had uh, lifted the pencil off the paper uh, where, the, where the light was. And I suggested a few weeks ago that this idea of playing with line weight lifting the pencil not only to lighten the line, but sometimes lifting it off the page to break the contour, as one of my colleagues once famously said, to let the light in, is one of the most powerful strategies we have to deal with light and form without complex and time-consuming shading and cross-hatching. So I'm going to introduce an idea that I haven't talked about before, not in the global studio and not in my own teaching. Most of the time, we think of sketching as an exercise in two dimensions, but, but uh, I thought it would be interesting to challenge everyone to start thinking of sketching as an exercise uh, in three dimensions. In other words, imagine the space between you and the surface of the page as a kind of thin volume within which you're moving your pencil, not only around the page, but also up and down into the material of the paper or the canvas and, and sometimes often out of it. And when I say pencil, again, I'm referring to whatever instrument you happen to be holding. Now, the man uh, on, the, on the right of the slide is a sidewalk calligraphy master, someone I met on a pedestrian street in Beijing in 2008. Uh, what he was doing here was clearly part of his daily routine. And I use the image here as a reminder of the, of the role of the line, but also of the power of uh, of calligraphy in the kind of sketching that we do. I'm talking about the gesture, when I, when I use the word calligraphy, I'm talking about the gesture that we make with the instrument in our hand um, when we are making a drawing, how we hold the pencil and, and how we actually move it. I met this man on uh, Wang Fujing Street in Beijing in 2008. He, he had a bottle of water in the plastic bag. That's what he used for his ink. And he would keep the brush charged by squirting a little water into the bristles every 30 seconds or so. It was a very, very hot day. Uh, and the characters that he drew would begin to evaporate almost as soon as they uh, were drawn, which meant that the writing would actually follow him as, his, as he made his way slowly down the street. Um, at one point, he, he, uh, I, I was very quiet uh, and uh, really, I didn't want to disturb him, but at one point, almost as if he sensed me not moving. He turned around, saw me watching, and he invited me to try by holding up that magnificent brush he's holding. I thanked him uh, and I wrote my name on the street beside one of his texts in reasonably literate Chinese, which I think surprised him. In the short conversation that followed, he asked me who I was, uh, how old I was. Uh, I told him, and then he slapped his chest and he said that he was 87. And, and meeting him in this way, I have to say, was one of the highlights of that visit. And it was an encounter that I've actually thought about uh, a lot in relation to sketching and, uh, and other ideas about what we do as architects. We associate the idea of calligraphy with written script, but we can also explore it in relation to the act of sketching. This uh, is actually an architectural rendering by a celebrated Canadian architect named Ron Tom. The project, is a, is, a, is a modest chapel in the woods, but it's the sketch I want to talk about. Ron Tom famously was a painter before he turned to architecture. And, and he's a member of that very small community of internationally renowned architects who actually never studied architecture. 
but uh, like architects, uh, uh, Le Corbusier, Arthur Erickson in Canada, and, and others, he, he was a painter first. Um, the architecture critic of one of Canada's best known newspapers, the, the Toronto Globe and Mail, Alex uh, Bozikovich, once referred to Ron Tom's buildings as revealing, and I'm quoting, a painter's eye for a texture in the varied surfaces of concrete, stone, brick, and wood. It's an idea you might want to keep in mind when you pick up Chibuzo's uh, challenge. This sketch, I think, is a fine example of what uh, Bozikovich calls the painter's eye, but also uh, an example of the calligraphic elegance of the stroke when the brush and the pencil are in the hands of a master. And when we zoom in, we discover an incredible and very, I would say surprisingly three-dimensional network of light pencil lines under uh, and sometimes on top of the layers uh, developed by the brush strokes and the watercolor washes. Um, every gesture over the course of the drawing adds information. Sometimes it's a little bit like eavesdropping on conversations at a party or in a crowded restaurant. And in this sketch by Ron Tom, it might be more accurate to compare the layers of information and how we hear them or read them, but I, maybe how we hear them um, to the performance of a symphonic orchestra under a great conductor. You know, we get the overall sense of the music, but we also appreciate, you know, the, the solo by the flute and the rhythm, you know, provided by the, by the bass and by the, and by the drums. Ron Tom is considered to be one of Canada's most accomplished architects. And one of his most iconic buildings was Trent University, built in the mid 1960s and actually straddling the Otanabe River near Peterborough in the province of Ontario, Canada. It's about five hours by car from my, my home where I am now. For Ron Tom, the building and the landscape are inseparable. Uh, to put it in words used by uh, a landscape architect and a, a former colleague of mine, uh, buildings aren't owned by people, he used to say, buildings are owned by the, by the, uh, by the ground they occupy. Uh, but for Tom, uh, they were inseparable. Uh, and it's an idea that's eloquently and poetic, poetically expressed in this beautiful rendering of the campus that he designed in the early 60s, seen from a distance. Now you're probably all wondering where the buildings are. Well, here are the buildings. They're actually in that little red frame uh, down at the bottom. And there they are, and there they are in close up. And when I zoom in like this, I hope you begin to appreciate the calligraphic nature, the extraordinary elegance of the, of the line. In this case, we don't see the layers of graphite that we saw in the rendering of the chapel. He seems to be working almost entirely, although there's a bit of graphite here and there, but he really is uh, using the brush in a masterful way. So there are the buildings of Trent, grounded and as much a part of the site as the trees themselves in the foreground. In this close up, Ron Tom is using the brush exactly like the sidewalk calligrapher in Beijing. The branches and even the buildings, for that matter, are the result of the way he's holding it, moving slowly and then accelerating. Uh, twisting slightly, at times lifting it gently from the paper and then pushing it down so that the line changes shape, or lifting it until it's only the very tip of the brush skipping over the dips and leaving the pigment on the higher points of even a lightly textured paper. When we do that with the brush or with the dry brush, when we lift it so, so that it's not off the page but just skimming over the surface, the white of the paper shines through. It's another way of letting the light in, as my colleague and uh, mentor, Gentile Tondino used to say. It's another way of letting the light in. Um, and you see in these two circles, the two red circles, I, uh, I could have zoomed in closer, I suppose, but I think you can see it pretty clearly, how the extraordinary quality of light and texture is simply the result of him feeling his way off the page as he delivers this stroke with the brush. Uh, Tondino, to whom I just referred, my teacher and former colleague, called this technique scumbling. Uh, but in, in the book, The Way of the Brush, which is an exploration of Chinese and Japanese painting technique, uh, author Fritz von Briesen calls it, and I love this translation, flying white. It's a technique that can be used to bring light into a drawing, even on paper that's only lightly textured. And, it, and it's a technique that can be used with other media as well, including pencil, I would suggest, as well as pen and ink. 
any line, I think, created with a brush or drawn in pencil or in ink or, or in the snow with the tip of a ski pole can be created as an exercise in calligraphy, like the flying white in the previous example. The drawing on the right is one of mine, a figure study from 1995. The media are sepia conte and wet brush, and it's a big drawing. It's about 80 centimeters by 110. The drawing on the left is a self portrait by the man in the little green circle in my figure study. His name was Harry Mayervich, a well known Montreal based architect and painter. He was in his late 80s at the time, and, and this self portrait uh, was his first experience with a tablet, a tablet PC, and a stylus on a pressure sensitive screen. I happened to be in my office, and he got, came by for a visit, and I was working on what for me was a new. Uh, tablet style PC. And he said, what have you got there? And I showed him I, and he said, how do you draw on it? And I said, well, here's the stylus. And he picked it up and he, uh, he, and he produced this unbelievable uh, self-portrait. Notice if you, if you can see it, the variation in the density of the line. So that's something, here he is working on this uh, electronic instrument for the very first time. And he senses right away that when he presses, he gets a certain kind of line. And when he, and when he eases off slightly, he gets another kind of line. So he discovers before anyone else that I've ever shown this technology to, the, the, the power of it. Um, his first experience, um, an essential component of the narrative that I associate with the figure study, on the figure study on the right was the presence of Harry at his easel on the other side of the model. And if I had to put a title on the drawing, and Kristen referred to this in a conversation in last Friday's feedback session, uh, if I had to put a title on this drawing, uh, it would not be a you know, figure study, it would be Harry, Harry at his easel. Uh, it, interestingly, here's architect Michael Graves again, with a good word about the idea of drawing on a tablet. He says in a handmade drawing, and, and surprise, surprisingly, well, maybe not surprisingly, he says whether on a, an electronic tablet or on paper, he says, there are intonations, traces of intentions, and speculation, and what better way to describe that uh, that amazing series of layers that we saw in that first rendering of the chapel by Ron Tom. In this close up of the figure study, we're actually exploring again how the line changes character, varying between light and dark, thick and thin, disappearing when an area of value uh, makes the line totally unnecessary and, and even undesirable, and reappearing to add a little information or pick up the narrative. When I talk about picking up the narrative, I'm, I'm referring, for example, to that hint of another easel in the upper left-hand part of the drawing, uh, rendered almost transparently. You know, for those of you, you know, used to working uh, with Rhino or SketchUp, think of it as X-ray mode. And almost every drawing I make with a pencil and in watercolor uh, starts as an exercise in X-ray mode. The next five or six images explore a series of remarkable sketches posted on the Global Studio mural board by one of our audience, Ken Ku, who has been participating in every single workshop and most of, not, if not all of the feedback sessions. And Ken, I think is, is still in the virtual room today. These are, these are two of the drawings and I'll say a few words about them in a, in a few minutes in detail. Here's a couple of landscapes. Most of the studies that Ken has been posting on the board are uh, on very large pieces of paper, 11 inches by 14, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and most are done in a local cafe uh, in Western Canada, in Edmonton. Uh, once in a while, he goes outside and these drawings I, I find uh, extremely interesting for all of the reasons that we have been talking about and that, and that Chibuzo referred to in his presentation a few minutes ago, uh, how the line uh, dances literally in and out, how the, how the line, and the, and the value a little bit like a couple dancing a tango. Uh, you know, at, at one point, one leads and at, at another point, the other leads. Uh, and, the, and the footwork uh, in a way is spectacularly interesting. And it's what makes drawings like this so, so profoundly powerful. Here's a, here's a close up. And the, the, at no point does the, does the contour kind of control or does the value control. If the whole thing is a kind of exercise in a dynamic sort of handing off you know, from between, from one to the other, almost like, almost as if they were having a conversation of their own, uh, in their own language uh, while you're, while you're working. Uh, I'm, I took, I take the liberty of uh, put, putting these two drawings side by side. 
on the left, a figure study by Ken in a cafe in Edmonton. Uh, and I, I was very intrigued by the figure in green on the upper left. And here, a study by Leonardo da Vinci, uh, probably from the late 1400s or early 1500s. Um, the concentration of attention on the figure in Ken's drawing in Ken's drawings and the organization on the page recall the sketchbooks of, of many Renaissance artists, not just Leonardo, uh, but many others, all of them, who would typically use their sketchbooks to capture and archive studies of figures, individuals and groups in various situations for later use in their paintings. Sometimes they even uh, use drawings of each other in their paintings, a little bit like the referential drawings that Michael Graves uh, talks about um, in a text that we referred to in one of the previous workshops. Uh, the study by Leonardo on the right is actually very small. Uh, and this is a page from the book that it's drawn from, so to speak, Master Drawings in Close-Up by Julian Brooks. And what I've done here, uh, before I scan the page from the book, I, I put a business card and traced it on the page. So what you're seeing is a comparison of Leonardo's original against a modern business card. In other words, he could have made that sketch on the back of a business card, just to keep that in mind. Um, when you have a moment later, uh, you can go back to the PowerPoint on the mirror board and read the text. But he talks about the fact that for a left-handed person, the hatching would always be in a certain direction as it is for a right-handed person. But uh, when Leonardo was working with his students, they would sometimes, even the right-handed students, would mimic the hatching of a left-handed person, which of course Leonardo, Leonardo was. In Ken Ku's drawing of that interesting character, that, that uh, Renaissance-like character in the cafe, notice how the contour of the shoulder and the arm take on a distinctly three-dimensional character, breaking here and there to let the light in, and also to reveal the general roundness of the form, you know, the, the roundness of the shirt or the or the top uh, as it makes its way around a shoulder or around the upper arm. Um, hounds can also, hands, uh, I said hounds, uh, you know, dogs are a great subject, but I'm talking about hands here. Hands can also be a great source of inspiration and discovery in and of themselves. In last night's, in last Friday's feedback discussion, we actually spent quite a bit of time exploring the idea of the hand as a subject. And one of the great things about the hand is that it, it's a part of a figure study that you can do yourself. Either, either drawing your own hand um, or setting up a mirror and drawing both hands. Here are a series of images of hands, all from drawings of mine over the years and all fragments of much larger studies. The, the one on the right, I would say, is from the most developed of the study. And it's in the same media as the figure drawing you saw before. It's sanguine or, or blood conte, uh, which is actually very water soluble. So I use it wet and dry, uh, and with a wet brush. There's no graphite there. It's just the Conte, either applied dry and, uh, and left dry, or applied dry and then washed, or applied dry on top of the wet paper. It's a lot of fun. I got the idea for this technique from looking at uh, reproductions of some of Piranesi's studies. Uh, the other two studies of hands are, are, are both from much quicker figure studies in a, in a voluntary life drawing session a few years ago. And this one, uh, for me, one of the most satisfying, one of the most rewarding. Uh, I think several of my colleagues have, in these workshops have talked about the idea of ambiguity in drawings like this. Uh, the notion, the notion that, uh, you know, when we draw, you know, we start, you know, with a very light line that doesn't need to be erased, and that, uh, and that we try, we try a line beside it, a different kind of line, and at some point we're satisfied enough with one of the lines that we maybe give it a little bit of emphasis, either with the contour or with a little bit of value adjacent to it or, or behind it. Uh, we may come back to that idea later. Um, this was an experiment with a brush and it's a nice exercise to do every once in a while when you find yourself getting a bit, of, a bit stale or falling into uh, bad habits. And in this case, it was an attempt of mine to minimize to the extent that I could the amount of information I needed to tell the story about this particular figure and their, and their five or 10 or 15 minute pose. Compare the 3D lines that describe the topography in this sketch of a 16th century uh, Genovese citadel on the Black Sea to the contours 
that we examined in Ken Ku's figure studies a few minutes ago. Uh, notice how uh, the, the shape of the land, the lines that describe the land and the lines that describe what remains of the citadel are, are really, really all in the same. And I've talked about this before, the, the notion that, uh, that the building is literally growing out of the landscape and that the techniques that we use to explore what that, what that means, uh, celebrate, celebrate the idea. So that some of the lines are light, some, some are darker, some disappear when the value of the marshes in the background, and that's an, an inlet from the Black Sea that you're seeing off to the left. Uh, sometimes the value makes the line not only redundant, as, as I said earlier, but sometimes even desirable. That was done a couple of summers ago. Uh, that's the same citadel drawn about seven years earlier. So from another from another vantage point, and uh, many of my colleagues in these workshops have also talked about this idea as well, the the notion that um, revisiting subjects that we think we know well can also often be be very very instructive. This is a, another landscape, part of Peru's sacred valley, and here I'm trying to work with the pencil in, in that in that thin three-dimensional space on the surface of the page. So it, it's moving into the page and it's, it's moving out and it's, it's, and it's playing three-dimensionally as I, as I move it along in, in strokes that mirror the geometry of the shaping lines of the agricultural terraces and the, and the natural formations of the hills in the distance. Another glimpse of the, of the Great Wall of China that, that uh, it's a drawing I've shown before, the same ideas are being explored but the opportunity to use the wall in the foreground to say something about the horizontal space and maybe the narrative, the story, was of course irresistible. A few weeks ago, we also talked about Francis Ching and his uh, rule of thirds. Henry talked a lot about this. I also refer to it. And, and both of us uh, talked about the notion that sometimes you've got to, you've got to break that rule. And, and here are two sketches that break the rule uh, where the real area of interest is actually in the upper half of the drawing the upper half of the frame, but we still claim the entire frame. In this case, it's a, uh, it's a very horizontal or a very vertical kind of sketchbook. Uh, it's an unusual proportion, but a very interesting and a very challenging one. Uh, but I, I'm, not, I'm not reducing the frame. I'm using the entire page, but I, I'm, I'm, and I'm claiming the entire frame because I need to explain the narrative. I need to explain the, the context. Uh, on the left, the, the sheer height of that wall in the center of Milan, the Castello Sforzesco, and in the right, uh, what was at that time uh, an abandoned or, or uh, repurposed but Buddhist temple in the, in the heart of uh, Shanghai about 30 years ago. In both sketches, the information fills the frame, but the detail is concentrated only in the upper portion. We've also spoken many times about the importance of figures, people in presenting the narrative associated with the sketch. And here are studies in a couple of different museums in Montreal. But it's important to remember that we populate our drawings with figures, not only to tell the story, who are all those people and what are they doing there and what kind of a space is that, what is happening? But also it's important to remember that we, um, uh, in this sketch of a monastery in Northern Romania, we use the figures to establish horizontal distance. And what you're seeing here in the big circle on the left or the big oval on the left is a figure very close to me as the observer. And then on the far right in the middle ground and then, and then at the back near the gate, the entrance tower, uh, two figures just coming in or just leaving. And the difference in scale, all of them attached to the horizontal red line, which is the horizon, telling us actually a great deal about the horizontal nature of the space. Two views of a busy street in a UNESCO World Heritage Site in the medieval city of Sigishwara in Transylvania. The sketch on the right was made about nine years after the one on the left, which makes it an exercise, not only in connection, but in reconnection. And of course, uh, I'm on the edge of the same square for both, for both studies. Uh, the drawing on the right is also an illustration of how the figures can be used to develop other kinds of information. For example, in this sketch, the downward slope of the street and the, and the slow disappearance of those suggestions in graphite and in watercolor wash of the figure slowly disappearing uh, dramatizes the, the nature of the street sloping steeply away. In this sketch of a, 
beautiful Shukuman house in the historic in a historic neighborhood in a part of the French concession in Shanghai, we discover another uh, possibly very effective strategy for developing the narrative. When we search the subject for other kinds of evidence of use and occupancy, two ideas that Chibuzo spoke to very eloquently a few minutes ago. Uh, how do we use the building as opposed to uh, its intended purpose? Uh, the evidence that we're looking for here or that we found were bicycles in that circle. That's evidence of habitation. It tells you something about the neighborhood. It tells you a lot about the neighborhood, which we can go into later. Uh, all reported, all related to the importance of actually seeing when you look. So if the bicycles is one example of an unexpected a very valuable form of evidence. The laundry hanging on the line in the circle in the detail on the left is a, another kind of important evidence. In this design sketch for the restoration of a pedestrian street in the same neighborhood, we find a mix of existing buildings and loose impressions, very ambiguous impressions of new structures, but also plenty of figures like actors telling us a lot more about the design intentions of the project under study here. The street barber in the red circle was actually borrowed from uh, his usual stand a, a few blocks away. Uh, here's one last question I'll leave with you. Does everything, and it's another idea that we haven't spoken much about, but which I think is actually very important. Uh, it's about reflection. Not only the reflection that we do in the course of making the drawing, but the reflections that uh, that we seldom see, but are almost always there. So my question is, does everything reflect something? And I tell my students, yes, even, even the asphalt on a, on a dry, on a hot summer day. Hot summer day. We're, we're generally quick to see reflections in water. Uh, even, um, even if there are some occasions, especially on a windy day, when we need to search the subject, we need to look very hard to actually see them. Uh, here's another example. Uh, on the the bigger drawing, of course, is the is the sample you know, or the um, the uh, quick study, a five minute study looking not only at composition but at some of the basic values, but also notice the idea of reflection, and the the final drawing or the final watercolor uh, re replicated here in miniature at the at the lower left. Yeah, but in fact, going back to the notion of where we find reflections, we find them all over the place. We find them. Uh, not just on a dry asphalt street on a hot summer day, uh, but on in polished floors, on wet sidewalks, uh, in in windows, and even in the clouds. On the left is a rendering by architect Stephen Hall of the main entrance in his Museum of Contemporary Art in Helsinki. And on the right, my photograph, uh, coincidentally, of the same space. Um, I didn't use his 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 drawing to position my photograph, uh, but but and it's a it's a, it's a not surprising coincidence that we're actually looking at the entrance from the same points of view. But the, my photograph of the same space, uh, I think, confirms Hall's own intuition with respect to reflections. Uh, and uh, although the, that great shaft of sunlight on the curving wall in my photograph on the right, which you see beautifully reflected in the lightly polished floor, is not there, you do see Hall exploring very strategically the um, the um, a number of reflections in his rendering on the left. Um, Hall uses watercolor sketches extensively in his practice, and in fact, he draws every morning in a notebook uh, that's about five inches by seven inches, a little smaller than the standard moleskin. His renderings reveal his, his deep understanding of light and of reflection and of the relationship between the two. And in fact, most of his early morning studies use the combination of the two, light and reflection, to explore the design ideas that uh, make his buildings so well known. Here, two extraordinary um, renderings, early morning renderings, uh, one of a gallery in Seoul, South Korea, and the other of a, a museum in Marseille, uh, both exploring notions of light and, and reflection. Um, he confesses uh, in an article uh, published just a few months ago, uh, and this is an extract uh, from the interview with him. I start working, he says, in my watercolors as soon as I wake up every morning for about 45 minutes to an hour. I start painting when I am barely awake. And he goes on to say, it's all about intuition. Good advice. 
Some of you may know the uh, legendary cartoonist Charles Schultz, who almost exactly 70 years ago, almost to the day, created the cartoon strip Peanuts, featuring characters like Charlie Brown, uh, his nemesis Lucy and uh, Van Pelt and her little brother Linus, and of course Snoopy the dog and a host of others. And this is what he says. It's, I, I, I love this uh, citation. He says, when I'm drawing, when I'm carrying on a conversation with someone, I find that I'm drawing with my eyes. I find myself observing how uh, the shirt collar comes around from behind his neck and perhaps casts a slight shadow on one side. I observe how the wrinkles in a sleeve form and how his arm may be resting on the edge of the chair. Go back to that wonderful drawing by Ken Koo. And Schultz goes on to say, I observe how the features on his face move back and forth in perspective as he rotates his head. It is actually a form of sketching, Schultz says, and I believe that it is the next best thing to drawing itself. What, what a wonderful uh, way to think about what we're talking about here. And I'm gonna close uh, uh, with another citation from Jerry Tondino, and I'll, I'll give the last word to him. When a student once asked him, but sir, how will I know when my sketch is finished? Uh, he replied as he usually did uh, somewhat enigmatically by saying, your sketch is finished when you stop drawing. And how you're wondering, will we know when this presentation is finished? Well, when I stop talking. Thanks for your attention. Thanks so much, David. Thanks for uh, ending it all with a little chuckle. Um, I am intrigued by your, your, your last comments about reflection and the, the idea of heat off uh, um, on a, or pavement on a hot day. And how in the sketching school, we've heard from Chris and Sechaba about uh, the idea of drawing the unseen. And I immediately started thinking about, okay, how could I actually draw the heat reflecting off of pavement? And how does it actually, would it, knowing how that feels, how would that affect my drawing as well? So it's an it's interesting, interesting idea. We could, do a, we could do a whole workshop just on that. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I love the image of the um, of the shimmering of the of the visible waves of heat. Yeah, you know, shimmering the lines of the drawing in the same way that the reflection in moving water shimmers exactly. when you when you toss a coin in. It's not a valuable coin, maybe a small coin or a lucky rock. Shibuzo, I'm sure, is very familiar with that shimmering heat as well. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, thank you both for, for wonderful um, uh, discussions on, on drawing and, um, and for Chibuzo really articulating six ideas for sketching this week. And um, we'd now like to open it up for questions from um, any of the participants or any discussion points between uh, Chibuzo, you and, and David. I thought the two, um, presentations uh, worked beautifully together. We, we wouldn't want to give you the impression that we actually planned it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, been, it's been happening a lot throughout this uh, wonderful series. Yeah, exactly. Um, I was so intrigued by the ephemeral nature of the man um, painting the calligraphy on the street. In, in Beijing that you showed David. Mm -hmm. and, and I couldn't help thinking as well about um, our, my friend and colleague, um, Tavang in Cliptown who's joining us is a graffiti artist and, and the, the sort of parallels between the different ways in which we express art, not only on the page, but on, you know, on, on or the urban surfaces. Um, but I also thought it was interesting because one of the things we've been talking about a lot in this feedback sessions is how to get away from the sort of um, attachment we have to our drawings and the preciousness of the drawings. And to me, what a beautiful study that man in Beijing is of, of, of truly letting go of the need to preserve what you're painting and what you're drawing and to just simply draw. And um, that was such a beautiful image. It really is. Um, it, it, 
what you say reminds me that it would be interesting to look at sidewalk uh, art as well, uh, which is also ephemeral, but a slightly longer lasting than the, than the, um, than the calligraphy. And what was, what was unforgettable, um, you know, I, I, I tracked him at one point. In other words, I followed, uh, you know, if he was working in blocks of four characters for the most part. And uh, I tracked him a couple of blocks behind. And, and if I waited too long, the, um, the characters were already eroding, sometimes before my eyes. And so it really was um, remarkable. I was going to refer to a, a short story by Ray Bradbury, um, which describes um, an encounter with Picasso on a beach in Spain. Uh, and it's a couple of tourists. I won't, I'll send you the link if anyone's interested. It's, a, it's an amazingly, Bradbury, Bradbury was a very poetic writer. He's um, often treated as an, as an author. You often find him in the science fiction section of the bookstore, but his, his writing goes way beyond uh, conventional notions of science fiction. Um, and it, so there are a couple of tourists on the beach and they see an old man going along the beach and then suddenly stopping um, and looking at the sand and then bending down and grabbing a stick and starting to draw. And, uh, and the man, I think, might, does he have a pair of binoculars? Maybe he does. And he picks them up and he says to his, his, his partner, his wife, that's Picasso. Uh, you know, it, it can't be true, but it is. And you know, it's, the encounter uh, renders him virtually speechless. Uh, and, he, and he waits and the tide is coming in. So you have to imagine um, the tide is coming in. He runs down the beach after Picasso walks away. Picasso finishes the drawing, um, looks at it, tosses the stick up on uh, higher up on the beach and then walks away in the same direction uh, that, that he'd come from. And he continues walking and the man runs down the beach to look at it. And then he looks up at, the, at where he's staying. And of course he knows that there's no way he can run back to his, to where his his room is, and grab his camera, and and get back in time before the tide comes in. So Bradbury spends, I think, most of the short story describing him on his hands and knees, going over the drawing with his eyes and and with his fingers, trying to uh, trying to capture it, trying to find some way to hold it, even as the tide is lapping at his at his ankles and and lower legs as it makes its way in. It's an incredible story, but it's, uh, it would make an interesting kind of um, uh, segue to, to, the, to the notion of ephemerality um, that, you're, that you're highlighting now, Kristen. It's so interesting um, thinking back to, the, you know, the, the, over the past months of working on this, on this course, uh, when we've met together, how often um, we've made the parallels between literature and, and drawing. And, and Henry highlighted this, um, amongst others, in the course of the fact that, that what we're doing is really telling a story. It's not just about replicating what we see in front of us, as, um, but about telling the story of what is actually going on. And I think we... Um, we saw that in many of your of the drawings you show today, like I, 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 that the one of the street barber reminds me so much of of spaces I've been in Johannesburg, where you know the the life spills out on the streets and activities which in other places often are done inside a building are done on this on the sidewalk and um, and and what an incredible window that is to the story of of life that's unfolding on the, mm -hmm. on the urban street. Um, we, yeah, I walked by him every day for two weeks. We were doing a, a studio with the local district government. Um, and uh, we were teamed up, a bunch of students from McGill with, a, with an architect in, in Shanghai, Peter Guafu, and a developer. And we were working with the district government on a, on a series of proposals for the restoration, basically, of, the, of this community. And one of our objectives was to uh, Preserve corners in the in the rehabilitated environment for the for that culture. There's a there was a cobbler who worked by, who worked nearby. Um, there was the street barber. There was also you know the bicycle repair uh, stations uh, all over the city. Um, I, it's, we were not very successful, but uh, 
but we we did our best to try to protect those kinds of those kinds of cultures. I think it was so interesting, Chibuzo, in your presentation as well to see that apartment building that has. Um, where only one of the units was actually being used as an apartment, and the others were all um, places of worship. Um, yeah. yeah, exactly. That's, that's um, something that happens often here. You see a uh, change of use often. See, a, a place that was designed to be a residential building used for a shop, used for an office, or a place that was designed for an office used for a residential building, it shows the, 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 the disconnect between the design and the use. But like you were saying, to the person that's not sitting down to sketch, the person is not telling the story of what is seen in front of you. Whosoever is going to look at that sketch later on in the future can now see that story within the lens of what, what actually happened as against this change of uh, this uh, uh, perfect idea that a designer had. I, I think it's so true, uh, Chibuzo, and that sort of gets at the real core of what we were trying to do with this sketching school is, uh, is address the fact that often people don't see themselves in the, story, in the story that's unfolding in an architectural representation because it's being, because we're, we're, we're being taught um, in, the, in the Western canon. And yeah. then in other places, people don't see themselves in those stories that um, are the drawings of architecture. Yeah. Um, it's, 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 it's high time the, the sketch is done, begin to tell those stories so that people can actually identify. It, it would be easier for a sketch that is done the way People are actually using the, the space. It will be easier for somebody to understand what is going on there and, and visualize himself making of, of, of that space than the perfectly drawn, like, like you and Sishaba were saying, perfectly done, finished, colored, rendered sketch that is perfect. But this one that shows the actual use, somebody can, can, can picture himself moving around that sketch as if it became alive in front of him. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. And it, and 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 if the context is so unrecognizable to people, then then it can't come alive to them. Yes, and so, it also goes a long way to show the 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 disconnect because um, if really those drawings or, or, or designs were done with a lot of things to consider. This um, disconnect won't be. And I think the purpose of this sketch also is for whosoever is sketching to see the reality of how things are being used as against the perfect picture he or she had in his or her head. And go ahead and propose something better. Because just opposing what was sketched or designed and what is he or she is seeing. You make him understand better. Oh, these people use this particular uh, element or this particular building in so and so so way. So if if I design like this, putting this thing I saw like into consideration, you actually give me a better design. Exactly. Exactly. Um, uh, David, I hope you'll put that link to the Ray Bradbury story on the on the mirror board or. I will. I will. I'd like to make a, maybe we should do a short film of it. Exactly. I just, I'll, I'll quickly share the mirror board um, as examples of two things I've just recently added. Um, permanent temporariness, which is, I added after um, a, a feedback session a couple of weeks ago, and one of the students um, shared some extraordinary drawings that she had done of, um, a park in uh, in Palestine that's in, that that's being turned by uh, is, Israeli designers into a so I'm sorry a, a cemetery that's being turned into a park and um, and so and this is a, a wonderful book by two Palestinian architects who talk about um, 
this idea, which also talks on, uh, speaks to the notion of ephemerality that we were just talking about, um, about this sort of architecture's role in that. And so it's a, and it's, this book is available online as a, as an open access PDF. And there's some really interesting ideas in it, but also a book I'm reading right now, which is very interesting about the history of um, the drawing and text of science fiction. And I, I brought, it connects to what you just brought up, uh, David. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it talks about the history in China of, of um, science fiction. And that's actually where that term was coined. It's the first documented um, usage of the term science fiction. And it was actually speaking to the colonial science, the Western science that was brought, being brought into China through colonialism and, and, and combining it with the traditional um, Chinese storytelling and how, and how that evolved into science fiction. And um, so it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating book, but, it, it, but it's just an example, I think, of, of there's so many sources to draw from to um, to really add richness to this conversation that we've started with this sketching school. Um, do we have any any questions from uh, from anyone in the participating? You're welcome to either um, type it into the chat or go ahead and 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 turn on your microphone and and ask a question. I'm I'm excited about your your assignments, Chibuzo, because I'm flying down to visit my parents this week, and um, they live in San Diego, and so I'm already thinking about going and sketching Louis Kahn's laboratory buildings in La Jolla for the Salk Institute, which which are some amazing buildings that sit right on the uh, top of a cliff um, on, on the coast there. So so now you've 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 given me a great excuse to go and do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am. I am glad that I made you go and visit your, your, your parents. It's exactly. something that we, we we encourage a lot in Af Afrocentric architecture for the young to go back to their parents and sit with them, learn from them because they are worth of of knowledge. So I'm glad that I I, I actually made you go and visit your parents. So it's, it's a plus. <laughs> Exactly. In fact, maybe I'll ask my dad to come and draw with me, which I haven't done in years. But he, uh, that, that would be nice. He, he and, he and nice. I drew together all the time when we were kids. Wow. And uh, it reminds me, you were talking, um, David, about the different ways of using pencil. I can, I'm not sure. I can't remember if it's Michelangelo or Leonardo da Vinci who had the exercise of drawing the same thing with both hands at the same time. And that was something that my dad and I used to like to attempt to do. Wow. So it's, uh, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting exercise. So it's time to bring back those memories alive. Exactly. Okay, well, if, uh, if there's nothing else, um, David or, or Chibuza, do you have any final, final words? or we'll wrap up the session for today. Uh, a quick thought, Kristen, about, about the meeting on March 14th. Yes. The last meeting. It, I thought it might be interesting to think about the possibility of a Pecha Kucha. Do you know what a Pecha Kucha is? No, I don't. I'm not sure if anyone in the, in the virtual room has ever heard of a Pecha Kucha before. It's a Japanese word. I forget what it means, but uh, it became very popular in Montreal about five years ago. And a Pecha Kucha is a timed, templated slide presentation, 20 slides, 20 seconds each, um, which is 400 seconds, a little over six minutes. Uh, what I've done with my students is use a modified Pecha Kucha. We cut it in half, basically. We, you know, we say 10 slides, 20 seconds each, so a little over three minutes. But I thought it might be interesting to invite uh, all, all of the group who have uh, presented workshops to not necessarily synthesize what we've done, but to respond based on what we've done to what we've heard. 
with a with a with a modified Petra Kucha, you know, ten slides, twenty seconds each. One of the things that people learn in Montreal about the Petra Kucha is that, uh, you know, you, you can't go you know, the format is it's very tight. You're cut off. Uh, 10 seconds, 20 seconds each, but you could show, for example, the same image um, 10 times. For, for example, uh, one, one of my colleagues once surprised the audience by using an, an old fashioned overhead projector and, and he, he made 10 drawings. Uh, each one was 20 seconds each to support what he was talking about. So, so it's not as rigid and templated as you might think, but Kristen, I thought we, we might give it some we might discuss it at some point and maybe consider inviting Chibuzo and uh, Chris and uh, all the others who have uh, joined us, Joanna, yourself, Henry, Douglas, if he's interested, uh, and any of, any of the students who want to do it as a, as a way of getting a bit of a conversation going on the 14th. That sounds like a fun idea. So let's, let's talk about that. Yeah, yeah, we can, we can. Um. In the meantime, people can look it up online. Pecha Kucha, P-E-C-H-A, K-U-C-H-A. -E I'll, put, I'll put it in the chat. And, um, and just finally, I really encourage people to come. Um, I think uh, it's, a, it's a real opportunity to come to the feedback sessions. Um, I love that. I hope, Jenna, you won't mind that I'm going to quote you. Um, but she's been coming to all of the uh, feedback sessions, morning and evening, each week. And... And she commented last week, I just don't understand why more people aren't coming because these are so great. And so I really hope that all of you will, um, will think about um, coming to the feedback sessions. Um, uh, again, they'll be this Friday morning and evening uh, mountain time. You can both sign up for them and see the schedule on the Global Studio uh, website. So. Um, so hopefully we'll see see many of you there, and I'll bring my my uh, sketches of the Louis Kahn building to uh, to share. And there's there's Ken Ku also putting a, a nice plug in for the feedback sessions. Exactly. Apparently he's apparently he's been picking our brains. Good to know. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm laughing at the picking our brains. Yeah, that is, that explains why I feel so strange. <laughs> exactly. I wondered why my brain hadn't been working quite right. <laughs> yeah, I was. I was feeling lightheaded. Now, now I know why. <laughs> uh, all right, and uh, thank you okay. so much, David and Shibuzo, for your presentations today, and um, and uh, we will close things with that, and we'll look forward to seeing people on Friday and again on the fourteenth of March. And we will send out um, more information about the format. And also I encourage you to, to look at what, um, what else we're gonna be doing in that um, uh, Festival of Architecture, because I think it's a really important question that we need to be asking with all the things we're facing as a society, um, you know, what is the future of, of architecture? And, and to me, it's a really exciting question because I think architecture has a huge role to play and, and, a, and a beautiful role to play. Um, so, uh, so I encourage you to have a look at that as well. I'll be posting more information about exactly what is going to be part of it. All right, and with Great. that, we'll, we'll say goodbye to everyone. Thanks everybody. And Ken, everybody. Ken, is Ken there? Ken, thank you for letting me use your drawings as a, as a model. Thanks everybody, thanks. Thanks everyone. Bye, everybody. Take care, bye-bye. Bye, Chibuza. Bye. -bye. bye.